welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes Store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week. At the Virtual Memories Show. I'm just about at the end of the crazy travel stretch. It started a month ago. Um, finished my business trip to Madrid last Thursday. And by the time this posts, I should be down in Louisiana for a, a pal's wedding. After that, I pr pretty much just train trips to D.C., um, FDA headquarters, Philadelphia, until a Christmas flight back down to Louisiana. And amazingly, um, a podcast opportunity came up during my spare hours in Madrid, but my decision not to bring even my backup recorder with me bit me on the ass. Uh, see, I landed Monday morning on the red eye, and um, I was tweaking on new vigils, staying up until Monday night when I could crash and try to get back onto the uh, uh, regular diurnal schedule keep my circadian rhythms going. And um, I had a business meeting Monday afternoon and then a reception Monday evening. And uh, in between, I looked up bookstores on my iPhone and came across one that seemed pretty promising, not a Spanish chain or, you know, a really hardcore Spanish language bookstore, um, but a place called Desperate Literature, which promised quote unquote, Madrid's best collection of new, secondhand and rare books in English, French and Spanish. So from where I was, I headed down to the Opera District to check it out. Um, I met Terry, who's one of the owners, uh, an English guy, I'm pretty sure, uh, learned about the store's lineage, um, which is sort of springing out of Shakespeare and Company in Paris, um, and found out about the four plus years they've been in Madrid and the the cultural impact they're making on, on the literary scene there and the, the festival they're trying to put on. And I thought, man, I really should have brought my mini recorder on this trip because I could easily get an episode out of this guy. So it uh, didn't happen. I didn't have it with me. Thought about going to an electronic store, picking that up, pitching the guy and recording the next day after the conference, before my next dinner. I decided I just can't do all that. So I gave Terry the info about virtual memories, um, offered to help out. If there are any guests of mine that they've been trying to reach for events through the bookstore or this festival they're trying to do, um, maybe next time I get out there, we'll, we'll set something up and I'll actually be able to record a conversation with them. But if you're going to be in Madrid, make sure you check out Desperate Literature, which is DesperateLiterature.com. They're also on, on Facebook. They have this great quirky selection, uh, at least for the English language side. That's where I was sort of focused. Um, lots of beat era stuff. It's pretty neat. A bunch of interesting first editions. Um, Terry seemed awfully knowledgeable the more he talked with customers who were coming and going while I was there. Oh, also, he gave me a great lead for a U.S.-based guest um, who I've got to contact once all this winds down. Um, anyway, Lost opportunity, but, you know, maybe it was the new vigil talking, but we had a really good conversation and, and I 
think I made a, a friend in literary Madrid. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you about the business side of it, although it was a good meeting for that purpose, too. On to this week's show. Um, our guest this time around is David Small, the Caldecott Award-winning kids' book illustrator. I've aged out of the kids' group set, so David first showed up on my radar um, around 2009 when his graphic memoir, Stitches, came out. Um, Stitches tells a very harrowing story of David's youth, including an awful medical procedure he was subjected to and a family dynamic so terrible that it actually made me stop griping about mine for a little bit. Now, that book was his first comic full-length piece, and it was a finalist for the National Book Award, which is a pretty mind-blowing achievement. But when you read it, you'll understand how fully formed and um, well-told this story is. Now, I say he was on my radar around 2009. That's just when I heard about the book and about David, but I didn't know anything about him, didn't read the book, took years. Uh, and the impetus for that was when I recorded with Jules Pfeiffer around Thanksgiving of 2014. And Jules singled out Stitches as one of the books that convinced him that he ought to start doing full-length books, uh, full-length comics. And he's just finished his, his big trilogy of that stuff. Um, so with that rec sort of recommendation, I figured it was worth checking out all of David's comics. The thing is, Stitches was it for the longest time. It came out in 2009. He did some children's books again since, but no other comics work. But now David is back with his second full-length book, the novel Home After Dark. Like Stitches, it's published by Live Right Press. Home After Dark is the story of an alienated teen, a reflection of David's memoir self. And he, he uses the same, you know, pen and ink and washes to convey this coming of age story of a really uprooted boy who has to deal with toxic masculinity in 1950s America. It's, um, it's very impressionistic. It's complex without being complicated. And it's also just, just gorgeous to look at. Now the book's around 400 pages long, uh, but the writing is sparse. And there, there's a little thing I mentioned during our conversation about just how much David manages to strip away from the text side of it and let the, the images and the flow of the story tell itself. I found myself devouring the entire book over the course of an evening. Um, David just has this amazing eye and he uses some off-putting camera angles or at least different ones that I'm accustomed to from from a lifetime of reading comics um, for the, the the visual angles for his panels. But as we talk about in the episode, there's a purpose to it all. And for someone who came to comics pretty late, David's sense of pacing is just phenomenal. Um, and again, the, the story just carries you along. It might be because he came to the form late and doesn't have all of the legacy issues with influences and the sorts of comics people make when they're in their younger days. Um, whatever it is, it follows a great career as a kid's book illustrator and writer. And we get into the pros and cons of being a late bloomer in every stage of his career during this conversation. But let me just put it this way. Home After Dark is luminous and heartbreaking. And it's no less real than Stitches, despite it's being fiction while Stitches is memoir. Pick up both of David's comic books, uh, Home After Dark and Stitches. You will not be sorry. Now, as far as caveats go, I uh, had to filter out the air conditioning noise in the hotel, and David's got a hoarse voice, so it makes it a little um, little tricky. And if you have read Stitches, you will understand why David has a hoarse voice. If you haven't, let that be your, uh, your, your ominous, foreboding, portentous symbol. Uh, also, we only had about an hour to record. We stretched a little past that. We were recording at the Small Press Expo. And David had a signing to get down to, and then a panel he had to be on, and then a train to catch to get up to the Brooklyn Book Fest where he was appearing the next day. Um, I like to think we were both kind of bummed when his handler showed up. Um, I would love to get out to his place in Michigan to, to record a follow-up or at least kind of extend this conversation further. But he describes that as being in a pretty isolated place, so we'll see what happens. 
Now, here's a brief bio for David. There's a longer version on his website, davidsmallbooks.com. David Small is the author of the number one New York Times bestselling Stitches. He is a recipient of the Caldecott Medal, the Christopher Medal, and the E.B. White Award. He and his wife, the writer Sarah Stewart, live in Michigan. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with David Small. We're going to talk about illustration and, and comics and your, your body of work. But one of the things in your bio that, that I have a question about was the line that you went to the MFA program at Yale and that you consider yourself a learn-as-you-go artist. Mm -hmm. Was art school particularly beneficial? What was the value, I guess, of, of that MFA or art training in general as opposed to learn as you go? The value of the art school at Yale was the degree that it gave you, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there were other benefits to being in a high-pressure situation, as that was. Uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a very tense um, atmosphere, very very different from the art school situation I'd had for a couple of years at Wayne State in mm -hmm. Detroit, where I didn't know it at the time, but it was a really marvelous art education. Uh, back in Detroit, the, they they had this um, very dynamic chairman named G. Alden Smith in the art department who had put together a very uh, young, dynamic faculty, um, all of whom, even if they were modernists, uh, seemed to have a respect for tradition in that they had a very strong drawing department. Uh, they even taught anatomy, took us to the Gross Lab once. Um, uh, and, and the student shows there were just wonderful. Uh, it really was like a family. A big family. There was there was healthy competition among the kids, but everybody was encouraging to one another. And when I got to Yale, I found this very cold kind of old school Thai atmosphere uh, in this hideous Rudolf uh, Arnheim building, um, which the student. No, I won't get into that. <laughs> but they they. Um, there was a war between the faculty. There were the modernists. The, the, there was Al Held with his huge abstract paintings. And, and there was William Bailey with his delicate uh, kind of um, 18th century still lives. And, uh, and, and there was uh, Bernie Chait, who was, a, who was a figurative artist. And, and then, anyway, there was this division. And so when they had student critiques, they were all held in this concrete pit where the students had to display their work, at, at which point the faculty would attack from two sides. It sounds really gladiatorial when you started it with a concrete pit. It was, it, was, it was a pit, and everybody was hanging over the balconies looking down. <laughs> Thank God we printmakers were excluded from those because we weren't considered artists anyway. And uh, so I never had the wonderful opportunity to have to rush out of that pit in tears like so many other people did. The education was, I, I had William Bailey as a drawing teacher. I remember the first day, the first week I was there in life drawing class, he came up behind me and he said, where did you learn to draw like that? And I said, in a good way or? In a good way. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Okay. And I, and I put my head down and talked into my shoulder and I said, Wayne State University in Detroit. And he said, really? Um, he said, you know, uh, the last three, five years, our very best students in this, in this uh, program have come from that school. Huh. And suddenly, you know, I was slapped awake, and I realized I had a really good start yeah. at Wayne. What was uh, it about your line and drawing that he liked? Do you recall? I guess it had some life in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I had been, when I talk about myself being self-taught, uh, you have to understand the zeitgeist at that time. It was, um, it was, this, it was the 70s. 
all the traditional art forms like drawing and design and color and all those all those studies had been drop kicked out the window basically. Um, and it, and it was an anything goes kind of atmosphere. And Warhol was you know dominant and Rauschenberg and and Larry Poons and uh, all these um, and minimalism and conceptualism was starting. And I wasn't against any of it. I wanted to learn about all of that. I just wasn't interested in painting or drawing that way. I wanted to learn anatomy. I wanted to draw the figure uh, from any angle, from, from, from memory. Uh, I guess all of this was preparation to be an illustrator, but I didn't know it. Yes, yeah, wondering, did you imagine no. yourself as a fine artist going in, yes, thinking I, you were going to be gallery? Absolutely. Gallery only? Yeah. And there were some artists, you know, working like Hockney and Ron Katai, who were my heroes at the time, and who showed that figurative painting could go on. Phil Perlstein was active, although we didn't like his work. Um, so the, the word illustrative was used as an epithet at Yale. They would always curl their lip when they said it, you know. Mm -hmm. This is illustrative. <laughs> and so I didn't even think about becoming an illustrator. But all of the artists that I had followed and admired, Rembrandt, Durer, uh, Daumier, uh, these were storytellers, you know, every one of them. And uh, so I always had this, this bent toward telling stories and pictures, even if I um, would sometimes obscure them in the way that Kitai does uh, or did. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. K-I-T-A-J. Yeah, an yeah, uh, artist pal of mine turned me on to him. He's, he's currently detesting Kitai's book. Uh, he's got a memoir or something out, and, and my, my friend just reviles it, but I think is hate reading it all the way through. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think much of his writing, yeah. and he seemed like a bit of a pompous egoist. Yeah, that's where my pal's coming from on this. Yeah, so. yeah. but there's no denying he was a great artist mm -hmm. until he changed his style and went abstract. His early stuff was just genius. Anyway. Did you stick with, uh, with Hockney also? And did you see the... Yeah, have I stuck with Hockney? No, yeah, I don't okay. like his new things. Yeah, I was wondering what you, you thought of that compared to the, the 70s and 80s and the pool paintings. And, Those were and, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And the drawing, the etchings especially, yeah. the rake's progress and so on. But I didn't follow any of those people. I Actually, when I was at Yale, I thought it was the reincarnation, reincarnation of Aegon Schiele. And Not bad. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my hormones were raging and... I had developed a sensuous line. Uh, there are echoes of that in the new book, especially with the the scene with with the other boy. Uh, uh, yeah. It reminded me of Shield when really? I was reading it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's Sheila. Oh, yeah. because I'm, I'm yeah, uncivilized. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shame on you. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have known except for my analyst that turned me on to him to begin with. Um, anyway, uh, where were we? Uh, you I was, I was sort of an outsider. Yeah. 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 And, but the Yale degree was a door oh, opener. Yeah, I was going to say, did it open doors for you in terms of when you started pursuing illustration? Yeah. yeah. Most of us who graduated that year, uh, 72, were um, seeking teaching jobs, and nobody got one, but I did. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what to attribute that to. Luck were, plays a big role in everyone's it doesn't matter how yeah. talented you are there's still a, a luck factor that, that plays into a lot of these things absolutely what did you teach or where did you teach I ended up in um, Fredonia New York at one of the SUNY schools hail hail Fredonia <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually was really happy about it because I had applied to schools in New York um, thinking that any school in New York State was going to be near New York City. And it turned out that Fredonia was almost as far, it was as far west as you could go in New York State yeah. without falling into Lake Erie and just across, you know, yeah. the lake from Detroit. It, and It's as though you were the reverse of the Saul Steinberg thing, where New York sees the rest <laughs> of the world as, as you, you had the opposite view of the... Uh, it had Steinberg. collapsed in a different way <laughs> for me. And I didn't realize this until we were on the road with our... Uh, U-Haul full of furniture 
I, I turned to my then wife and said, my God, we've been on the road for eight hours. And we were just outside of Buffalo at that point. And that's when I realized I'd made a geographical mistake. Yeah. And um, anyway, I taught there for several years. That's where I met Sarah. We were both married to other people, both in the middle of bad marriages at the time. So that was a good thing about going to Fredonia. But I, um, I, I, I taught, uh, you asked what I taught. I taught life drawing, my favorite subject. I taught, I made my students, I tortured them by teaching them anatomy or making them learn anatomy because that's what I wanted to learn. So I was going to ask, what did you learn in the act of teaching? Because uh, yeah. most most teachers I talk to don't have a good answer for that, like what they figured out in the course of it. But it sounds like you specifically wanted to... to I aim things toward what I was interested in. Yeah. Gesture drawing, uh, anatomy. Um, I, I don't know if I was a good teacher. People say I was. I still have ex-students in touch. Um... But I think it was more my enthusiasm for the subject than my my ability to speak about it with any you know in any cogent way. Um, I drew all the time in front of the class, so some people find that difficult, but I I found it a, thrilling to. Could you speak while drawing? Yes. Okay, because that boggles my mind. I have no visual and drawing skills whatsoever yeah. but when i talk to illustrators who can show videos of themselves drawing and explaining it yeah. it just blows my mind that you can right. balance those you know yeah yeah it's um it's a skill you have to develop mm -hmm. but uh i also found i was pretty good at getting people like yourself who thought they couldn't draw at all to um to get at least a good start and and i think they enjoyed the class anyway i taught that i taught printmaking until uh, it became apparent that the chemicals were poisoning us all to death because we were working in a uh, building with no ventilation in the studio at all. So these fumes, these acid fumes, were eating up the metal furniture and probably <laughs> doing the same thing to our lungs. And I just closed the whole mm -hmm. operation down. Yeah, I did an episode with uh, Robert Andrew Parker a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he mentioned how he and his son almost burned down a friend's barn with whatever the, the chemical was that they were using. Yeah, uh, she, uh, nitric. The, yeah, yeah, he spilled some, and, and well, the, the son spilled some, and uh, <laughs> they had to run outside the barn and start spraying in trying to, to oh put God. the fire out. Oh, my God. We yeah. were so careless in those days. Mm -hmm. Um and it, you know, we used to bathe our arms and hands to get the ink off. We'd bathe them in benzene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This friend of mine in the chemistry department came into the studio one day. He said, what are you doing yeah. in here? And <laughs> that's, that week was when I closed it down. I, I have a friend who's a, a, a medicinal chemist who does a blog about medicinal chemistry, and he has an ongoing series of compounds I won't work with. Um, yeah. The greatest one was there's something that will actually literally burn through concrete. <laughs> not not like acid eating away, but it's like that scene in the alien. Where yeah, they, where yeah, where they the, the blood and comes the blood off and, down three yeah. floors, <laughs> and and uh, that great actor says, uh, can I forget his name? Uh, he says it's got a great defense mechanism. You can't kill it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or you don't dare kill it. Yeah, yeah that was uh, harrowing when I was reading Derek's post about this stuff. Good but God. did you? Uh, how long did you stick with teaching? Or is it really once you I, got illustration work at a... Well, from there, I thought teaching was going to be my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I did enjoy it. Yeah. I didn't enjoy university politics, or did I, nor did I do well on committees. Mm -hmm. I used to pe draw people's shoes. Everybody thought I was taking assiduous <laughs> notes, but I was drawing their shoes. Um, but I went from Fredonia to Kalamazoo College. Uh, a friend of mine at Fredonia... Carol Harrison, a sculptor, had come from Kalamazoo, made the same mistake I had going to Fredonia, thinking he was going to be near New York City. And we both were, would commiserate about how miserable we were there. And she actually stole my resume from my desk and sent it when she heard that there was an opening at, at uh, Kalamazoo College. She said, I think you'll like it there. And I didn't know. I didn't want to go back to Michigan. Uh, I just knew Detroit. I didn't. I didn't know any other parts of Michigan. But when I got there for my interview, I found this um, wonderful little uh, Georgian architecture. This little 
uh, you know, Parnassus on a hill, uh, just absolutely, outwardly, the, the, the very kind of college I wanted to teach at. And, uh, and it was a good teaching gig because nobody went there to study art. These kids were, uh, some of them were brilliant, they were all very ambitious, all A students, um, and they went there to study sciences, uh, math, computer science, languages, everybody had to take a language. And they had a wonderful program where they would, um, the only time you as a student would spend uh, time on campus, a full year on campus, was in your freshman year. And then in your sophomore year, you had to go out somewhere in America and find a job in something that you thought you would want to work at. And like they had programs, you know, for people who wanted to be journalists at newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then in your junior year, you went to Europe. And, uh, and then in your senior year, you had to get an apartment off campus and work on a senior independent project. And it seems screwy. That's just a weird way to like get rid of faculty, or at least to reduce the amount of re reduce the amount. Well, yeah. it was a small campus and yeah. limited dorm space. But um, I used to wonder, you know, are they giving these kids too much freedom? But they actually, they didn't because the kids were very uh, ambitious, as I said to begin with, mm -hmm. driven, and they most of them got good jobs afterwards. And so it was a joy to teach these kids who were not there to learn how to fling paint. Um, and the ones who actually had artistic talent were much more interesting than anybody I'd ever met at Yale because they had a background in something else. Mm -hmm. So they came, you know, with uh, a, a knowledge of French literature or a knowledge of computers or, you know, and these things got into their images. And I had some of my best students were there. But then the recession hit, the Reagan recession in the 80s, and the week that I thought I was going to get tenure and sort of settle in for the rest of my life, they came. The, the provost came to me one night and told me that not only was I not getting tenure, but that my position didn't exist anymore. And uh, uh, so Sarah and I found ourselves without a paycheck, without a savings, without a home to live in, because we used to live in campus housing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and for five years, we had sort of a struggle um, before I got on my feet as an uh, illustrator for magazines and newspapers through an agent in Chicago. Did you have kids? Mm hmm Kids? Did we have kids? Yeah. Uh, from other marriages, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah. Not together. Yeah, we decided we'd... Had enough of that. Yeah, <laughs> my, my wife and I figured that out beforehand. So you know, we managed to go without kids the entire time. So it's a good move, except you know, destroys the population uh, in another generation or I, so. I approve, actually. Yeah. yeah, which is ironic, given most of your body of work is illustrating books for children. Yes, um, that doesn't mean that. But you like being around kids. <laughs> you know, actually. I like kids. I like my own kids. I mean, yeah. certainly I lost touch with my own through a bad marriage, a bad divorce. But um, Sarah's kids, my stepchildren and I have been very, very close. And I'm fortunate to be a, a stepdad rather than a full-time Yeah, so we're the crazy dad. aunt and uncle, and that, that works pretty well, too. Yeah, That's it kind of extracts the guilt factor in a, in a, in a good way. But, that's a Jew. Nothing extracts my guilt factor, but that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's another matter. Yeah. Probably. Again, maybe, maybe an analyst. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, kids' books, yeah. I, uh, I sort of fell into that by accident. Um, I was um, working as an editorial artist, and I had one, I had had published one kids' picture book, but even though that felt like a triumph, you know, the question in New York is, oh, you did a picture book? Yeah. Uh, meet Stephen Kellogg. He's done 70, and he's mm. younger than you. <laughs> and, um, you know, same with getting a cover on The New Yorker, or, uh, you know, yeah. oh, how many times have you done that? It, it's, it wasn't what I thought, you know, publishing yeah, it. When I did one with Ed Corrin uh, a couple of years ago, he talked about selling his his very first submission to New Yorker, his first gag panel they bought, and he thought, 
I'm done. Got him ready. ready. Yeah. 18 months before they bought another one. And that was his, oh, <laughs> this is not going to be the rest of my life, huh? And, and what did and they pay him? $250? Even back in the 1950s, it's probably the same amount now. So <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you think you have these milestones and then you discover that, you know, there's always, what are you doing next, I guess? Yeah, so. it's the same in anything. Yeah. Um, I, but you had that first book. I had that first book, and it was a success. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then editors started passing me around, and uh, and then I had four more books, and then Imogene's Antlers came out in 85, and uh, I got a very excited call from one of the young editors at Crown saying that it had just gotten on Reading Rainbow. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What's Reading Rainbow? <laughs> And she said, oh, it's a TV program. It, it, it's absolutely the best thing for selling books other than getting a call to cut. And I said, oh, really? Uh, what's a call to cut? <laughs> I had no idea the world I was in. Um, but Im Imogene's Antlers was the beginning of a, of a successful career in, in Kid Lit. And at this point, I've done, I think, close to 40 books. Mm -hmm. um, and been generally happy with it, especially after, you know, getting a call to cut. I was able, able at that point to drop the, the editorial stuff, which I enjoyed, especially working for The New Yorker. That was so much fun. But it was, it was work that was very interruptive. Uh, by that time, there were fax machines, and, and then soon after came uh, the Internet, and... So I could live anywhere on Earth, and if they wanted my illustration, the New Yorker would hunt me down, which they did in Mexico in the winters where we, where we go. And it, was, it would always go something like this. She would call at 9 in the morning. She'd say, can you work? And I'd say, uh, yeah. And she'd say, okay, I'm going to fax you the, uh, the article. Uh, or she wouldn't fax me the article. She, just sent, she would just send some pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it was a movie, you know, I'd get the actors in costume. Um, and she'd say, uh, you don't need to send me a sketch. I trust you, David. Is what this Francoise, by the way? or No, it wasn't Francoise. It, it was uh, Chris Curry. Oh, okay. Do you know her? No, no, yeah. I haven't met her. She was fun to work with, but it was always frantic. Um, and very hard to turn out a weekly, you know, with so many... Tough enough for us to read it, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And... Um, and then I would have to have the, the art in the mail by either that afternoon or, you know, at the, at the latest, the next morning. And, um, and the pay was not that great, but it was always a thrill to see my stuff in the magazine. Yeah. This was during the Tina Brown era, mm -hmm. um, when they were lightening up a little bit and doing color more. And so I would do full, full color illustrations, and it was okay to show women's breasts bared if I wanted, if, if I thought it was necessary. Um, but then all that changed when Tina uh, went elsewhere. It, be, it went back to being more restrained, in a way. And they, they, um, they started hiring me, but that never publishing my work. And I even once saw, uh, I even once did a job for, it was a film that I had to illustrate, do a little spot for, which, uh, when the magazine came out, um, had been drawn by somebody else. Basically the same situation, um, but this was the, this was the one instance where I had drawn a woman without, with bare breasts. Yeah. So, um, they just hired somebody else to, to, to redo my drawing, and, um, it was very bewildering. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, they, I got my first full-page illustration. They wanted me, to, wanted me to do a drawing of Courtney Love. And I did one of the best things I had ever done for them. I just love that. I still love that picture. And when the magazine came, I thumbed through it, and it wasn't there. There was a photograph of Courtney Love, but not my drawing. And I called up Chris, and I said, what's wrong? What was wrong with that drawing? And she said, that drawing? Oh, Courtney. Oh, I remember. She said... You know, we had a meeting, and we realized that we had published an entire uh, edition of the magazine without one photograph. So, sorry, David. We, 
<laughs> and you know, arbitrary life. <laughs> uh, it got really frustrating. And right at that time, I got a call to Cat Award. And so when Chris called again, I said, um, you know, I think I'm not going to be doing this anymore. It's been great working with you. But um, I'm just going to concentrate on kids' books, which I obviously seem to have a flair for. And been able to support your... Uh, had you had to do side illustration, or was it really a self-supporting It was. It became role? self-supporting after that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was one of the benefits of the Caldecott, you know, was... You, Keeps you, you in you demand. You do get more contracts, okay. yeah. What makes a a good manuscript for a children's book? Like, is there something that jumps out at you or appeals to you that you think, man, I would love to illustrate this, as mm -hmm. opposed to the, eh, mm. Well, I came up in kids' book illustration with uh, some particular heroes. Uh, Sendak was one, to, you know, yeah. everybody loved. But um, not as much as uh, Tommy Unger. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, even not as much as uh, Edward Arizoni in England, and um, Unger in particular, I loved, because um, like E.B. White in prose, this guy would write text for his picture books that didn't talk down to children. He mm -hmm. used language that actually made kids stretch. Even their adult readers had yeah. to stretch for some of it. And his stories were funny and irreverent and... Uh, a little creepy sometimes, uh, and I really admired that kind of book. And also, and his stories were good. There were stories actually. So I, if I didn't write them myself, I would look for that kind of story. I didn't always find it, but um, I wanted a certain sophistication. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what kept me awake. Unfortunately, things have taken a turn um, lately where there don't seem to be any stories out there being told anymore. Um, the books are, recent kids' books um, are beautiful to look at. A lot of young artists are adapting that kind of 40s style, like Rojankowski and Tengren, where everything began to you know, be oriented toward, exclusively toward children. Uh, you know, little round faces and lots of flowers and candy colors. And beautiful, beautifully designed. But the stories are all, they're, they're lacking, in my opinion. Not that I've read everything that's out there, but I go to a store and I go to the children's department and everything seems to be these concept books all about girl power hmm. or boy power or, you know, some kind of power. Um, it, they're teachy. And that, 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 I think that is the number one thing that I really tried to always keep away from in my, the books that I would select and the books that I wrote. You know, it turns out if you've got a good story, it's going to have a lesson in there. But what, what I need to begin with is a good plot with really interesting, sympathetic characters and a good beginning, middle, and end. And lo and behold, if you get that, there will be a lesson in there, but these lessony books that are being published nowadays in such quantities, uh, I think my theory about kids listening to them still holds true. You, you know, a kid can smell a lesson from a mile away, mm -hmm. and they may look alert and stuff just to make you think they're paying attention, but right. in fact, <laughs> their minds are <laughs> millions of miles away making up stuff, and, um, well, I don't know if that's true anymore with screens giving them all their, sucking all their imaginations out, but uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a funny twist. Um, also, I don't draw on a computer. I was, I was going to ask, either that or has anyone tried to bring you into some sort of digital project as opposed to primarily print? No, I've just stuck to my old-fashioned, messy yeah. pen and ink and watercolor and pastel stuff, and uh, it seems to be working for me. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've got this far, so I feel <laughs> you're probably on a good run. So. <laughs> yeah, it might, and it, you might come back into popular. I think hand-drawn hand stuff is becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. 
I even see computer stuff imitating hand-drawn things yeah. or, or integrating. Yeah, and, Roz, uh, Roz Chass has started doing iPad drawings, not for her actual cartoons, but mm-hmm. she's posting things on Instagram that oh, somebody right. gave her that in an Apple Pencil, so she's trying. And you can see that it's it's still a Roz Chass drawing, but the line's different because it's... Drawn on a screen. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's always that slickness, and yeah. you know, there's a certain... I was in a conversation with people at dinner last night just about writing uh, and how we have our very, very specific pens mm-hmm. that we use because the other ones scrape the paper wrong mm-hmm. and you don't feel right. So I can imagine for someone for whom it's actually that critical to, to make the line. A- actually, have you had, um, dare I even look? That's, that's My pen wow. looks like a little cigar. <laughs> I was going to ask. You're going to be an Art Spiegelman and start vaping on <laughs> me. Yeah. But um, you need this to sign the books later. Yeah. Um, are there tools or, or materials that you used to use that you can't find anymore that, that bum you out? Uh, fortunately, if you search the Internet, you can. I can still find... Like one guy in the Czech Republic is still selling <laughs> this paper and you've got to... You know. Actually, I use a... St- I, we live in Michigan. No art supplies anymore, anywhere. The last store died like 15 years ago. Um, and I was bereft... But I did find this store in St. Paul uh, that has everything I need, and if I, if they don't have it, I can they'll order it for me. Mm-hmm. And so I have a lively exchange via UPS, a good relationship with them on the phone. Yeah, um, they're part of a chain called Wet Paint, but I think each individual store has its own character. I really mm-hmm. like the staff in this place. But you haven't had any, they don't make X anymore and... and Not really, good. no. And they're always, you know, uh, they know what I like. Mm-hmm. Um, they know my work. They know that my graphic books have been drawn exclusively with what, with mm-hmm. their materials. And they constantly send me little samples of paper that they think I might want to try out. Or different kind of watercolors. And, uh, you know, it's nice. It's just not down the block anymore. Right. Yeah. We should ask about the books. Going from illustration to making full length, I call them Correct. comics. We can call them graphic novels if you want, but, you know, long form comics, yeah. uh, however we, we phrase it. Um, what was that transition like for you, doing a memoir first and now this new book of fiction? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I had. Uh, I had an editor at Simon & Schuster once who suggested that I might want to think about a graphic novel, and I immediately said to her, no, too many little pictures. Well, that's never... sort of my question. How do you go from 40 pages yeah. with a picture every go... page or two to 400 pages? Of... Yeah, it's like going from poetry to suddenly Tolstoy, you know, it's yeah. the, uh, the Russian novel. It's uh, uh, very different. But I, so at that first suggestion, I rejected the whole notion. But um, I had been working for about 10 years at that point, on and off, on a memoir. Um, there was something that, about my childhood that I knew I needed to examine, but I couldn't get past the first scene. Uh, things got too scary for me after that. Anyway, uh, we, Sarah and I were in Paris for a week one winter. And we were visiting a friend of mine, um, Francois Place, also a children's book illustrator. And Francois's son, Pierre, at that time, was living in a small apartment and working on a graphic novel. And so we went to see him. And I looked over his shoulder at the drawing board, and I saw what he was doing. And I thought to myself, yeah, too many little pictures. I'll never do one of those. (laughs) But then Pierre, who knew my work, turned around to his bookcase and started pulling off, pulling out some books by European graphic novelists. A guy named Blutsch, a guy named um, De Crecy, uh, um, and the man who, the guy who did uh, Triplets of Belleville. Yeah. Um, and oh, suddenly God. forgotten his and name. And I just listened to the soundtrack uh, a yeah. couple of days ago, too. But I'll look it up. We'll yeah. put it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I suddenly found... Uh, a kind of camaraderie in picture making um, that I had never found in anything American because I'm not a superhero person. Yeah. And uh, uh, here were these 
stories. I, I couldn't read them very well because my French is not that good. Um, but the pictures told their own story, and what they told, told me was that they came from the same influences that I had had, not only in art, people like Daumier, of course, but um, uh, in film, Hitchcock, Truffaut, Bergman, Antonioni, Fellini, uh, all those great films from the 60s, um, which showed that you can visually tell the story without visual pyrotechnics. You can build suspense, you can create tension in very quiet, very subtle ways. Um, uh, and I had been studying film as an art form since the, the late 60s in college. And to put those two things together, my love of drawing and my knowledge of anatomy and my ability to draw the figure and architectures with these cinematic elements suddenly seemed like the way to go. Mm -hmm. And so I went, we went home that winter and uh, I would go over to the studio, which is like a three minute walk down the river from where we live, and I would work every day on my, my current children's book project and then I would go back home at night, around five, and Sarah would be offered her Tai Chi class, and I would sit down at the kitchen table and mix up a little martini <laughs> and start drawing my memories. And the minute I started doing that, uh, for example, when I was able to bring back my mother on paper, and I felt her presence around me again, uh, and our living room, which I reconstructed piece by piece on, on the paper by... Um, I could remember nothing about my living room except one lamp. So I drew that, and then suddenly I could see the, the little coffee table underneath it. And then the next thing I saw looking down in my mind was the rug and the pattern on it, and then the sofa. And all of a sudden, the whole set was there. And as soon as I had reconstructed the set, the ghosts started coming in and populating it and populating it and wow. reciting those lines that I had overheard. And it became both exciting and terrifying to me. And uh, because I had had, as you know from reading Stitches, a, a very difficult childhood. Um, but this became a book that I had to do. Because I realized as, this, as these drawings began to develop and my memories started coming back, I realized that what had compelled me to tell this story all those years, even when I couldn't remember a thing except one incident, was that I, I wanted more than anything to go back into analysis. Uh, I had had this marvelous analysis for 12 years when I was beginning when I was 14 which is a really good time to get a troubled kid into yeah. you know, therapy. But um, here I was in my 60s, I think, and, um, and I wanted more of it. But the place where Sarah and I live, out in the prairie in Michigan, like hundreds of miles from Ann Arbor or any place where there's any responsible psychological care. And so I realized that if I needed more analysis, I was going to have to do it myself and that, that, that this book was helping me. So I just followed that routine of drawing every night um, and uh, started sending stuff to my uh, agent, Holly, in New York, and the drawings began piling up on her desk. For, and finally, after about five months, she called me up and she said, David, as you know, I love what you're doing. I don't want you to stop. But, honey, I have to remind you, books have chapters. <laughs> this this was the Roz Chast thing, too, when she was working on that. that really? Piece. That memory? It was the exact same thing. She didn't know how to make the book. She kept making pages and pages. Yeah. And she said her therapist was the one who said, have you thought about chapters? And th yeah. that was revelatory to <laughs> yes. her. Oh, my God. I, I, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Books have, they're organized in ways that readers can follow what's going on. Yeah. And uh, it was a revelation to me and, and sort of a relief, but also a challenge and a problem at the same time because once you begin shaping 
a story like that, you find yourself, and if it's a memoir, you find yourself in a very, uh, a very dicey situation. In terms of the demands of story versus factuality? In terms of factuality. the demand of story and arc and uh, climaxes and development, all that sort of thing, um, which necessitates eliminating a lot of things that you thought might have been important in your life, but which would interfere severely yeah. with, your, with the arc of your story. Um, uh, and you don't want to invalidate it, but you, you don't, don't want to just turn it into fiction. And, and you certainly don't want to invent anything. Yeah. Um, but I also found myself rearranging things in terms of time, um, especially the dreams that appear throughout Stitches. Those are all dreams that I've had in my life, but not necessarily at the time that I present them sure. chronologically in that book. But they all seemed significant to whatever situation my young protagonist was in, so I would drop in a dream to, uh, as they do to me in my own life, to explain what's going on. Um, so it was a really, uh, it, was a, it was a real challenge, and I fell absolutely in love with the form, yeah. making that book. And you really didn't have much comics experience prior to that, that France trip? I never read them except for Pogo when I was a kid. Wow. Um, I loved Pogo, even though I understood about a third of what I was reading because yeah. it was all political. But I did sort of understand the Warren Commission through him, <laughs> yeah. through Walt Kelly. Um, oh, I read other things. I read Mad Magazine, the first copies that came yeah. out. But that's different than, you know full-length comics yeah. or ongoing story. And, yeah. Right, and yeah. so and same thing with Zap in the 60s. Yeah. You know, those five things were um, fascinating to me. But uh, no, I'm, not a, I'm just not a comics reader. Mm -hmm. So what you see in my books, although I'm certainly using a lot of the, comic, the conventions of traditional comics, I don't slice and dice my pages up the way some do to try to equate... Uh, Schwarzenegger movies, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's very much pacing. Uh, you, you mentioned pacing is a, a key aspect of what you do. It's just, the, the, I think, conveyed a little differently than, yeah. you know, again, chopping up panels like you were saying. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and my influence, as I said, you know, Hitchcock, Polanski, Bergman, yeah. Antonioni. I, you also I, pick some visual angles that I think speak to that, too, that, that are not conventional. This is where I would put the viewer's eye looking down on, on certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, that when you mention those directors, it makes a little more sense to me yeah. as to where you're coming from with that. Yeah, I was saying to a group at a store the other night, I, I, um, when Hitchcock, the master, mm -hmm. threw the camera up to the ceiling, he did it for a reason, an editorial reason. Um, when he shot from the ground up, the actors... Uh, and Orson Welles, too, was a master of this. There was always an editorial reason. Although Welles went overboard with it and made every shot fabulous yeah. and exhausting, Hitchcock had no uh, problem uh, doing very long, almost boring, visually boring um, moments of film, and then he would hit you with something so it even had more impact. Unlike today, in action films which I've seen plenty of, everything is, uh, the camera is flying up to the ceiling, looking up your nose from below, swirling around the figures, and it all comes to nothing because all that uh, visual frenzy is basically there in most cases to cover up the fact that there's really no story. Yeah. And whatever story there is was made by a committee, and it's full of cliches and boring tropes and... Uh, don't get me wrong, Hitchcock made a lot of lousy movies too. Yeah. So did Polanski, so did Bergman. But every one of their films, for the most part, are, are worth watching for their technique. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Nabokov said uh, in his wonderful lectures on literature, he says, uh, style is everything. And he didn't even have to expand on that, although he does for pages and pages, for me to understand what he was talking about. 
And I've used his own book, Lolita, as an example of the proof of that. Because uh, what is Lolita? You know, it's a story about this dirty old man who has this sexual obsession with a 12-year-old. Her mother dies. He takes her on a long road trip. They make love in a motel. And then she meets a handsome young hunk and leaves him, and he's very sad. The end. Hmm. But because of the style, because of Nabokov's amazing language, he takes this banal, uh, tawdry tale and turns it into an orchid or a butterfly, yeah. more appropriate for him. Yeah, for him. You know. yeah. Um, it's all style. So Hitchcock can make a lousy film, uh, like maybe, I don't know what's a lousy film, To Catch a Thief or... Uh, this, this. Yeah, to just have a sort of by-the-numbers film yeah. for him. Yeah, yeah. The, um, he, he was a working filmmaker, you know, he, he, yeah. he cranked him out. But there's always something about the style that keeps you riveted to the, to the screen. Mm-hmm. And in, those, in that respect, though, what did, you, what did you learn about storytelling? A, through the process of memoir, uh, uh, through stitches, and then what you had to learn to tell Home After Dark. Mm. Um, well, I'll go back to film. Sure. Uh, you know, the week that Bergman died... I think Antonioni died at the same in the same mm-hmm. week, and they were comparing filmmakers. Um, and somebody, some reviewer, pointed out that despite their very very different styles, all three of those guys were circus uh, managers, you mm-hmm. know, impresarios. Uh, even Bergman, whose films to most people or Antonioni, for that matter, seem like uh, boring talking heads. If you're really involved in the film, as I, you know, I love, I love those guys. If you're giving, if you're working with it, there's always something going on between those talking heads, either in an expression or the turn of a face or the lighting, to keep you riveted to the to the situation. And um, what? How did I get off on that? Storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. Visual storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and, and learning how to apply that into a static medium like comics? Just imitate it. Yeah. That's all I do is imitate it. Yeah. yeah. But were there things that you saw that, oh, that doesn't work because that's a, uh, you know, an active visual medium as opposed to a, a static one and things you had to adapt? How much, I guess, did the, the experience you'd had over the decades with mm. illustrating children's mm. books play into telling those stories visually? Well, one of the things that I learned as a kid's book illustrator is that the job of the illustrator is to expand the story, Mm -hmm. to tell something that the text doesn't tell. So in the best of them, there is a give and take between the words and the pictures that that makes a fuller picture. And um, same in graphic novels. uh, In Stitches, and even more severely in Home After Dark, I've even though I have to write everything out before I set pen to paper and start drawing it, even though I need a verbal structure or a kind of literary structure uh, to hang on to, um, I the, the work of the last several edits is always to get rid of as much language as possible. I was going to tell you, when I was reading it, there was a moment of exposition that came up and it had been so long since there was exposition, I forgot the boy was narrating. <laughs> it, it, there was an I in there. I thought, Who's talking? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this isn't third person. This is the first person. So, and I, it, but you'd stripped away so much of the exposition, it, it felt like that the story and the dialogue told it so well, you didn't mm-hmm. need this authorial voice chiming mm-hmm. in. Um, took a while. It always yeah. takes a while to, to learn what you don't need. Yeah. And in my case, I draw things out. Uh, pretty thoroughly. I, at one point, I had a version. I, this book went through 12 full, fully different versions. <laughs> took three years. Um, and in one, at one point, at one early point, I did have like uh, a narrator. I showed him as an old man. Russell was an old man looking back on his life. And uh, eventually realized that that wasn't working, didn't need it, uh, could, do, could do with much less than that. Um, 
And where did Home After Dark come from for you? Uh, the difference from going from memoir to fiction like yeah. this. Um, you know, most of my illustration jobs have been other people's stories. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't have that many stories to tell, I guess. Uh, you had a pretty good one with stitches, but, <laughs> yeah. but okay. Yeah. And my five or six picture books, I think, are pretty good, too. But I've done 40 of them, so most of them have been other, other people's work, including my wife Sarah's. Some of the best books I've illustrated were written by her. Um, and so it took me, between the time Stitches came out and Home After Dark appeared, it was about 10 years almost. And during that time, I was looking for somebody else to tell me a good story, because I didn't think I had any. Um, but it, none of them were working. And then finally, uh, in 2015, we were down in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, where we spend our winters. And I have a good buddy down there who's my same age, uh, who is an expat from California. Mike grew up in uh, then rural Marin County back in the 50s. And uh, for one reason or another, one morning at coffee, we always have coffee together uh, in this little coffee joint down in the Calle Sayano. And, and, one, and, and Mike is a great rock tour. And one day, I don't know what spurned it, but he started telling me stories about this one summer that he spent in his town, Santa Venetia, with these two buddies, all three of them 13, and all three of them completely free of parental control. And they built a tree house in the forest with stolen materials from the new houses that were springing up like mushrooms everywhere. And up in this tree house, they did all kinds of guy things, you know, smoked their first cigarettes, got drunk, speculated endlessly about sex, and, and made frequent forays down to the uh, soda joint on the highway to watch the other teenagers and to see what was in their futures. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, so, uh, and every day they would play games in this abandoned gully full of junk. And as I was listening to these stories, I, I was sort of half listening, but but also feeling a kind of an envy uh, because Mike had a childhood that I would like to have had, but it was so completely different, and he's a completely different person from me. Um, much, I wanted to have been that boy, you know, with that kind of childhood and those kinds of friends and so on. Uh, his stories really caught my attention, though, when a little psychopath entered the tales, because there was this kid, uh, I named him Benny, um, and he used to be in the book, um, who was uh, murdering small animals in Santa Venetia in macabre ways. And it was a very small town, and most people knew, suspected that he was the one who was doing it. And, we, and he, this kid used to hang around their group, wanting to be part of it. And so one day they caught him alone, and they had evidence that he had killed some cats and left them in the ravine, and uh, they beat the shit out of him. And that pretty much was where Mike's story ended, except for the fact that, having been raised a good Catholic with a deep moral sense, he wondered for the rest of his life if what they had done was the right thing. Had it changed Benny? Had it, you know, would it alter his behavior? Probably not. Um, maybe more importantly, uh, were they ever going to run into him again? Um, you know, would he, uh, would he um, end up in San Quentin prison uh, or in the newspapers for some hideous crime? Or perhaps he would end up in high political office? You know, we never know, <laughs> do we? But um, uh, so anyway, I thought this was the basis for a really good story. And it wasn't mine, so I, you know, felt felt uh, that I could happily develop something from it. And I started making drawings, and I made an outline, and with Mike's total approval, sent it off to New York, and my editor and my agent loved it. And, uh, and so I started working on it and had a contract. And um, about three months into the process, I realized it wasn't working. There was something fraudulent about it. Um, 
and my agent told me what. She said, David, this is not working for me either. It has no heart. Your voice is lacking here. You're trying to imitate somebody else's voice, Mm -hmm. your friends. But it's just, it's not ringing true for me. So I went into a depression for about two months, didn't do anything. And then one day, uh, a friend on the phone, his friend is a very well-known author, told me, um, he said, your your agent's right, David. The the very best... um, the very best books always have something of the author in them. And if you're going to go that route, you're probably going to have to confront the thing that scared you the most at that age. And I took that as a, as a good challenge. Uh, I don't have any problem scaring myself. Um, and it seemed like a good logical next step, having done my early childhood to sort of wade into the bog of my adolescence and really find out what what went on there. And so that's when my main character, Russell, stopped being Mike and started being me. And even though there are a few elements, like the treehouse and the gully and and so on, of my my friend's original story, it became a story more of a kid more like myself. Um, With all my fears and uh, my experiences of being bullied at school and my um, sexual ambiguity as a 13-year-old. Uh, never had any, having an exa- a real example of what a man was, wondering if I was or ever would be mm-hmm. one. Um, and I found lots of places where I could insert myself into that narrative. And the during the final edits, um, I think I was on my 10th full version of the book, when I decided that I had to really, really, really make this my book, to really create verisimilitude here. I was going to have to get rid of three major characters, including little Benny the psychopath, because those cat and dog murders were beginning to take over the whole book, yeah. and they were taking away from taking the reader's attention away from what was really the essence of the book, which was the development of my character, his his search for his own identity. And uh, so I eliminated Benny, but the murders I kept. The animal murders now are going on in the background of my tale um, so that they become a kind of a metaphor for something rotten at the, at the core of the, especially the male society that Russell hangs out with, um, a kind of a symbol for the effects of toxic max- masculinity, to use a modern trope. Um, and just like uh, 10 years after this story takes place in the 50s, in the 60s, the Charles Manson killings of Sharon Tate uh, and her and her friends would become a kind of symbol to the nation of uh, of the whole culture, um, having made a break for freedom and going off the rails completely. Uh, and just like school shootings are today, a kind of national metaphor for something really wrong at, at, at the core of our culture. Um, so that's... That's where Just it came a from. Little huh? bit of how it all, yeah, that's where it came <laughs> yeah, from. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so long winded. No, that. no, it's an amazing book. I was just, I mean, how does it feel for you, like discovering this form at this point in your career? Is it something where you wish you had been doing long form comics or graphic novels when uh, you were younger? Or do you think that you had to reach this certain stage in your own life? I don't have any regrets about my, you know, late development. It's yeah. always been late. I got started late on doing the illustration to begin with. I was 38. Um, I don't have any regrets about the way things have gone for me. If I had meant, if I was meant to do graphic novels or comics before then, I would have. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. And Stitches made me dive into it in a serious way. And I love the form. I really hope there's a third book in me at least somewhere. Um, I don't know where I'm going to find it, but... You'll hear more good stories. That's it. Uh, you know, 
I'll keep my ears open and yeah. listen to people talking about their lives and, and spark things in me. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I've continued to do kids' books too. Yeah, so. yeah. I thought you'd continued that as part of because again, doing one book every ten years. Uh, as far as yeah. graphic novels go, is not, not going to keep put you. Not food on the table. <laughs> yeah. right. Even in the prairies out in Michigan. <laughs> right. um, you're running out of time because we have to get you down to SPX soon okay. to the, uh, the the signing. But I wanted to ask, um, when you mentioned Sendak and, and Tommy Unger. Getting to meet your heroes, have you had those sorts of experiences or have you never quite? I had a chance to meet uh, Sendak yeah. uh, after I did a a couple of books called Companies Coming and Companies Going with Arthur Yorix. Uh He was a close friend of Sendak's, and they hung out together every weekend at Sendak's place in Connecticut. And one day he called me up and told me that Maurice loved those books. And uh, yeah. so I always thought, you know, there was a chance he would, if I wanted to visit him, he did. But, you know, I've always... I've had enough experience meeting famous people that I kind of don't want to meet any more of them. Sure. If especially if I really love their work, mm-hmm. um, I don't want to get to know them that well. It, it kind of grounds things or deflates them or takes. I don't. I'm not sure how to put it. Not get you. Except you, that you, some of them are much assholes too. And, There's that. Know, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's and that 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 takes your enthusiasm away from their the genius works they've created. It, uh, so I never did meet Zendak. Um, I did go to a book signing where Tommy Younger was there at one point, but I didn't talk to him. I was too shy. We have a mutual pal, so I could conceivably connect you if you're willing to go out to Ireland to to meet with him. I don't really. Because of all things, uh, I do this out of love as opposed to any sense of audience building uh, a few years ago my wife and i were at a german literature translation event because i'd done some interviews to help them promote that and a guy who was receiving an award there was the guy who translated musil's the man without qualities oh my gosh. and old old man he's he's talking and my wife looks at me she's like you you have to interview that guy i'm like yeah i do and so we connected afterwards record like two and a half hours of conversation about his life how he ended up getting that that book even though he'd never really translated commercially and then it turns out he's good friends with tommy really and i kind of pitched it then he's like well i don't i don't think that would be i don't think this this you know recording setup would be very good for him i'm like okay you know you you know him well you've gone through this experience with me so maybe you know i'll, I'll trust you on this one but i do have an in is, is all i'm saying so, you know. <laughs> thanks never been to ireland i didn't know he lived there yeah i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he'd it's Ireland proper, the Republic, but um, they yeah. take care of their artists over there, don't they? Yeah. You know, I know Gary Groth, the publisher at Fanographics, I think had a long meeting with Tommy to to do a, an interview recently. So, yeah. you know, I think that's where he traveled for it. But yeah. um, yeah. my other question: you mentioned Nabokov, um, literary reader. Do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I usually ask people about their books, but we've had so much about the illustration and the work you've done. What artists or what writers do you uh, do you dig? Um, or who are the big uh, influences along those lines? Big ones, uh, Flaubert, mm-hmm. huge. Um, you know, he he. Uh, well, I won't tell you why I love these people. Flaubert, I've probably read Madame Bovary and uh, Sentimental Education three times each, at least. I loved uh, Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. Mm-hmm. Um, never was a Dickens fan at all until I read Nabokov's praise of particularly Bleak House. I was going to ask that because to me Bleak House is the, the yeah, big one. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. descriptions of London, you know, mm-hmm. fabulous. But um, uh, Nabokov, everything he ever wrote. I.B. Singer, everything he ever wrote. Um, 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 contemporaneously, I mean, contemporary-wise, uh, I do read. I do read modern fiction. Um, liked Franzen's The Connections a lot. Um, it's specific books by sp- specific authors. I just I try to keep up with what's current, but um, often as not find myself getting sixty or seventy pages in and hurling the book against the wall. Okay. Um, 
and going back to reread something that I've read before. Uh, I generally balance between books that I need to read for guests for the show and then just going back to classics. That's yeah, been my... Uh, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what I do. You've got to keep your hand and got to be aware of what's, what's being done and who's doing it well and who isn't. In terms of graphic novels, I don't read a lot of those. I've bought a ton of them on recommendations of friends or reviews. I have this whole room filled with graphic novels, but there's really only three or four that I can name that have stuck with me. One of them was uh, Jillian Tamaki's This One Summer. Yeah. Which, I've heard great stuff about it, but I've never read her. Oh, my gosh. It's... Well, when you begin it, because the dialogue is all this teenagers, uh, you know, like, 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 everything's like uh, awkward, inarticulate stuff, you think. What keeps you reading is the art. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get into the book and get into the language and get into the situation, it's it's wonderful. It's just it's captivating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember whether it was Jillian who wrote it or... The other one who illustrated, but they're yeah. cousins. Yeah, yeah, same last, same name, same last name. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a pretty brilliant one. Uh, there's a guy over in France named Cyril Pedrosa, uh, Spanish or Portuguese origins, but he lives in Paris. Um, he came out of Disney and worked for in a couple of graphic novels in that very Disney esque style, but he's been able to cast that off and adopt a more adult kind of uh, style and uh, certainly in content. Uh, Pedrosa did a book called Portugal mm -hmm. uh, about finding his roots in, in, in Portugal and it's recently been translated I, I think by Joanna Cordley. Um, I didn't find the story that captivating but the, but, the art is just so yeah. amazing it, it makes me... Uh, I can't look at him when I'm doing my own work because I don't want to be influenced. Really? Okay, that's, that's interesting. But he's obviously got, you know, similar roots in fine art drawing uh, as the way I try to teach myself. David, thanks so much for coming on Thank the show. Thank you so much. I wish we could talk longer. And that was David Small. His new graphic novel is Home After Dark, which came out last month from Live Right Press. You should get that as well as his debut, the memoir Stitches. David's also had a long and storied career in illustrating and writing kids' books, so you ought to check that. Sorry, check out that work too. Um, you can visit davidsmallbooks.com to learn more about all his projects, as well as the galleries that um, sell his his artwork, which I am sorely tempted to take a look at. Now that's D-A-V-I-D-S-M-A-L-L-B-O-O-K-S dot com. David Small Books, no weird spelling, no dashes or underscores. And after we wrapped, I asked David, so who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I'll get the third quarter episode up soon, probably next weekend. The most recent episode features book recommendations from last quarter's Virtual Memories show guests, including Stephen Heller, Dean Haspiel, Jaime Hernandez, J.J. Settlemeyer, Michael Kupperman, Ilana Meyer, Christopher Brown, Irvin Ungar, Alberto Manguel, Chris Reynolds, and Dave Calver. Oh, Alberto Manguel is the answer to the If Gil is Stuck at a Book Kiosk in Madrid trying to find at least one book by somebody he has recorded with, which is a thing that I do when I go to bookstores in the U.S. and U.K., um, Manguel was the guy who I stumbled across just as I was giving up hope that I'd find a book by anyone I'd ever recorded with. So thanks, Alberto. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, which I'll get back to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. 
Now, I recorded this episode at Small Press Expo in Rockville, Maryland. That trip cost me about 300 bucks for the hotel, maybe 100 bucks or so for food. Travel costs were covered by my company since it was the same site where I was hosting my own conference immediately after SPX. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Lescamella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with one of my all-time favorite artists, the great Eddie Campbell. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memory Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memory Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. 